Our church has been described as being full of mysteries. Over the last two centuries, many suggestions have been made regarding its age and its history. The only thing that was certain from studying documents is that there was a church in Barrow in 1086 and that it was given to the Knights Hospitallers by Robert de Bakepuss in 1165. We therefore invited archaeologist Peter Ryder, historic buildings consultant, to reassess the structure and help us to better understand its history. Morning, Morning. Graham. Good morning, Peter. Peter Ryder, church archaeologist, has come to Baron Trent to some work for it to tell us about our church. Yeah, what can you tell us? Well, it's an interesting church, but first of all, it's in an interesting churchyard. Mm -hmm. So if you can see where we're walking here, the churchyard is curved. Yes. It's what they call subcircular. And the churchyard that has a curved boundary or is circular is often a clue you're onto something really quite early. Right. If you're planting a church on a virgin site, not constrained by pre existing boundaries, you would often have a circle. Uh -huh. And it's not just that, and you can see it's a fairly old wall. Oh, yeah. It exactly. looks an old wall, but there's some interesting stones on the wall. These stones, on, on the coping of the wall, recycled are stones with this very distinctive incised pattern, oh, like yeah. V's, yeah, yes. we've got a chevron pattern. Yes, that's very yeah. distinctive of around 1100. Uh -huh. so, so, so that's a clue to something's going on. This place is important. To us, hey, very yeah. important. Yeah. Um, well, Peter, as, as I look at the church, you can see you know, various different buildings, probably four, five, I think six even buildings. And can you tell us how it's sort of evolved? Well, slowly over a long length of time. It is a very complex structure. Yes. Lots of village churches are. This one we've been fortunate, it never got heavily restored by the Victorians, mm -hmm. so we can read the fabric, read the evidence oh, right. much more clearly. Yes. But a lot's gone on, as you can see. I mean, straight away when I look at that church, I say, the chance is too short, something's happened. Okay. But when we look more closely, I think we have some more evidence. Oh, well, God, that be very evident. Yeah, let's, have, let's have a look. Oh, let's, yeah. let's discover. Yeah. Right, first thing that strikes me, Peter, is this, this beautiful doorway. Yeah. Here. What, what's the historical importance of this? It's important. Yeah. This is the private entry for the family from the hall into the churchyard. Oh, and right. hall and church really went closer together here. Mm -hmm. They were in the same big enclosure. And again, that relationship suggests something quite old, really quite early. Yeah. You know, maybe a Saxon thane would found his own private chapel. Oh, right. Quite a few churches started like that. And where you see a hall or a castle or a manor house with a church in close attendance, that's a clue to pretty early origin. Mm, so Saxon, this maybe. is Victorian. Yes. It does, it's, you know, 150 years maybe. Mm -hmm. But it's very nice. Oh, it's nice brickwork, old, old weathered woodwork and these beautiful hinges. Mm. So yeah. sadly we've lost the hall. We still have its private doorway to the church yard. Oh, something really isn't yeah. there. Yeah. One thing's always intrigued me, Peter, is you know the elevation of the church. It's very high here. Oh yes. Yeah. Is the reason for this? Well, you, you're on a knoll. Both the church and the hall are on a slight knoll. Of course, looking out here, the flat-lying expanses here. That's the floodplain of a Trent. Yes. So we're just above the usual flood levels. Okay. So yeah, it's a sensible place to be. Yes. Yeah. The church of St Wilfred is made up of six blocks. The tower, the nave, the north aisle, the south aisle, the porch, and the chancel. This is the south porch, a nice round arch, and up above there is a recess. That would be for a statue, possibly St Wilfred. Probably added about the same time as the tower and clerestory in the 1400s. Uh, it, windows in the sides, simple little pairs of lancet windows, but um, interesting, inside they have level sills. That's an interesting detail for a medieval church, often the sills slope. But the fact that um, you're in the churchyard here, they could have had a lantern or a candle inside. In fact, there are candles inside now, if you look, to shine into the churchyard. Light was important, light was symbolic. Light in churchyards to dispel any evil spirits that were lurking was important. In French churchyards, they often had a pillar with recesses for the lanterns in it, called lanterne de mort, a lantern for the dead. And this may have been a similar sort of thing. This is um, the corner of the chancel and the south aisle. And this is where we really see the evidence for the beginnings of the church. Because in this corner, we can see some stones exposed. Behind the drain pipe, there's often exciting things behind drain pipes in old churches. But these corner stones, these great big blocks, they call them megalithic, big stone, megalithic angle coins, and they are distinctly Anglo-Saxon. 
the Normans just didn't do it like that. When you find stones like this, we can only just see them in the corner. That shows we have an actual standing Anglo-Saxon structure. Wow. And that's fantastic. It is. It's Anglo-Saxon. Yeah. Wow. Right, just look at the chancel wall here, Peter. Very interesting wall. Lots of different features, isn't it? Lots of things here. This is this is archaeology. It's archaeology above ground. Right. It's fabric you can really read. It tells us a lot. Lots of interesting things. This doorway. Yes. This is late Norman. It's got a, it's got a round arch. Yes. So it's possibly late 1100, 1200. It may date the chancel. Right. But it's been blocked up. And then when they brought it, they've inserted a, a window in it. A little window you can see with a, oh, a yeah. four-centered arch. Window, yeah. yeah. And then that in turn has been blocked up. Mm -hmm. And if you come along this end, there's this stone which is a medieval gravestab. Just mm. reused an old stone. I like medieval gravestab. There's quite a few recycled in the walls here. The, cr the crosshead was at this end, it's it gone. But you can see the shaft. Yeah, you can see that. Then ab there. above this is a very nice 14th century three light window. Then if you look above, and you've got the cranial necks here, there are three red stones. Yeah, those are different. Those colors, are all yeah. bits of grave covers. Same sort of day, maybe 12th century. There's an, another fourth bit right up by the head of a drain pipe, above the left, a bigger chunk. Yes. And if you come at night and get an oblique light on those, you can see the designs and photograph them. They come up quite well. Yeah. And if you go to this end of the wall, there's a buttress. Now, this buttress is now at the end of the wall. But originally, it was halfway along the wall because we've lost half the chancel. Yeah, Probably in the 18th century, the eastern half of the chancel was pulled down. And if we go around the corner here, there's the evidence. And this is a key section of plinth. Plinths are always interesting. The plinth comes round and then it's returned. This stone is crucial. It's returned along here. Yes, clearly, yeah. Had this been the end of a chancel, the plinth would have run across. It's actually returned. We've lost half the chancel. Probably in the 18th century. It may have been in poor condition and fallen down, had to be rebuilt. But we have a truncated chancel, only half a chancel. And it would have presumably gone to the end of the church? Yes, the altar would probably have been somewhere where these gravestones are over here. Yeah, right, here we are at the East Wall. Would you talk details about this? Well, this is a bit of a, a patch up job. When the eastern part of the chancel was pulled down, probably in the 18th century, they built this wall. I mean, the plinth is rather rough and ready. <laughs> so is the window. It's a big window and it's got medieval stonework, but that's recycled from the original east window further out. But the head of the window, that sort of flattened three-centred arch, is very Georgian. Yes. And there's, there's no, there's no mullions or tracery. No. So it's, it's a very Georgian piece. It's, I mean, it's interesting. It's part of the story, but it's not so sort of beautiful Gothic. The Victorians would have hated this. But the whole, the, and then in the wall, there's quite, there's more recycled grave covers. There's a piece up here with a sword on. You can see. Right. If you come, if you come at night with an oblique light, you know, you pick up more. Yeah. Right, Peter, we're here at the site of the boiler room. It's uh, not very pretty, is it? It's part of the story of the church. The boiler rooms are archaeology too. Oh. But to be honest, we can do without it. I think we can do without this, this chimney. Um, because yes. I think that may well conceal more Anglo-Saxon coins, the northwest angle of the nave. Yeah. So we, if, if that could disappear good. quickly, that would be a good idea. Yeah, so we can do about that. Yeah. <laughs> this window, lovely 14th century window, what they call a reticulated net-like tracery in the head. Yes. Little window in the corner here. That lights this strange little tunnel cutting between the, the North Isle and the chancel. We'll see that inside in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Doorway that probably led into a vestry once. Yes. There may yes. well have been a vestry out here. Yes. So, and the walling, um, there are lots of things you say the walling we haven't time for. <laughs> but the brooching on the stone is interesting, the way the stone is tooled. Yes. And there's quite a variety of types no, of brooching, so they're probably reusing stone from different parts of the church here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Peter, we're at the uh, junction of the North Isle and the Tower, and yet again another drain pipe. Another drain pipe, and look behind it, it's interesting. If you can see behind, there are more coins. Yeah, but yeah, they're not like the Saxon ones we no? saw at the south-east corner of the day. This is the northwest corner. These are Norman type coins. They're only the height of one, they're not megalithic. No. They're only the height of a course of, of walling. Yeah. So this is the other end of the nave before the aisle was added. But something, we know the aisle went on in the 13th century, so it's older than that. It's probably 12th century, but it ain't the west end of the Saxon nave. That might have been longer, it might have been shorter, but this is probably 12th century. Definitely normal because the yeah, coins are too small for the mm. Saxon, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, come to the west doorway then, Peter. Yeah. Any real importance of this? Well, the west doorway of the tower, the tower's probably 15th century. 
The doorway, it's a very, very simple Gothic arch. Could be earlier, they could have recycled a 13th century or 14th century piece. Mm. You can't always date things closely. No, I guess not. Yeah. Well, let's go inside and yeah, see yeah, what yeah, we find sure. Before we enter the church, let's remind ourselves of the six sections. The tower, the nave, the north aisle, the south aisle, the porch and the chancel. Well, the first thing we arrive about Peter is the font. What can you tell us about this? Yes, well, it looks to be a, a good late medieval font. The actual base with these nice big brooch stops could be 13th, 14th century. The bowl looks a bit later. Um, it's lead lined, and I'm looking for evidence for fittings, because if a font had fittings for a cover, that shows it's medieval, because they were concerned about people stealing the holy water to use for bad purposes. <laughs> I mean, there, there certainly would have been an earlier font. And if you want to find your earlier font, it might be down there. Right. Because when they, a font was subs to requirements, they buried it. They actually had a service for font burial. And no cases of Norman fonts being found complete, buried underneath later ones. Now we're inside the building, Peter. Uh, what can you tell us? So it gets a much clearer picture from the inside. So tell me about There's a lot to see. Yes. Well, for starters, we have bare stone walls. Now, if I were a reincarnated medieval person, I'd be shocked because church walls should be plastered and painted. This, they're all there, but as an archaeologist, to see the fabric, that's quite exciting. So we can, we can read the story, and we can see a lot. And as I've mentioned, this church more or less escaped Victorian restoration. One of the latest things is the roof. The nave roof's probably 19th or early 20th century. Then a, a lot happened to the church in that, what people sometimes call the Dark Ages, you know, post-medieval, up to the early Victorians. If we have a look at this pillar in the South Arcade, can you see the face of the pillar? It's all been hacked back. Yes. Yeah, that's smooth. It's been hacked there. Then the base has been cut right back. That's to put box pews in. Maybe around 1820-ish. Mm. You know, Georgian pews. So they, they weren't worried about the way they mutilated the medieval fabric then. No. That probably wouldn't have happened later. Other things happen. If we go into the aisle, look at these windows. Very, very simple looking window. In its original form, 14th century. But if you look at the sides, you can see it's been hacked back there, and then further up, just where the arch starts, there's a smooth section, then another hacked back section with the tooling, then another smooth section. Well, originally there's been tracery in this window, there'd be a mullion up the middle, and maybe dividing like a Y shape further up. But at some stage, maybe in the 1700s, just to get more glass in, maybe, yeah. they chisel that out. Now, the Victorians, if they'd restored the church, would have put that back. They didn't. So we can see the story much better. Oh. Yeah. So what can we see here? Peter? Well, we're looking at the, the west end of the nave with the tower arch. Um, there was a gallery here at one stage. You know, a west gallery, maybe a musician's gallery. You can see various infilled sockets in the walls. Yes, yeah, so you decide. Yeah. And also, if you look up at the north jam of the tower arch here, there's lots of graffiti. <laughs> you see, and again, people would have been in the gallery to have that graffiti. So gra graffiti in churches, you know, to be discouraged today, but interesting when it's 200 years old. But then the tower itself, that is an addition to the church at probably the 15th century. And at the same time as the clerestory, which is the range of windows high up. If you look up at the side walls, you can see there's much better quality masonry higher up. Yes, with these three windows on either side. And that's very similar to the masonry of the tower. So it looks as if there was a major remodelling at some stage. They built the tower and they had the naves, new roof, new, clar new clerestory. The clerestory windows had tracery, but as we saw with the aisle windows, somebody at some stage, maybe in the 18th century, cut it out. Right. Yeah. So, but the actual raising of the walls at the West Tower, mid 1400s maybe. And obviously done the same time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're looking at the east end of the nave now. And unlike the West End, we can see a steep roof line of an earlier roof. That is the roof before the clerestory was added in the mid-1400s. And the stonework below that line is some big squared stone and lower down around the head of the arch, some very large squared blocks. That's taking you right back to the earliest phases of the church. So we're in the south side of the nave, Peter. What can you tell us about these three arches? Yes, well, this is the arcade into the south aisle, added about 100 years before the clerestory. Mid-1300s, maybe just after the Black Death, which wasn't a very good period. 
and um, probably added as a chantry chapel for the local manorial family, where mm. prayers would be said for the souls of the departed members of the family. Right. Three very nice arches, and you can see the wall therein is fairly rough squared stone. Then above there's a clear break and the added clerestory, much larger blocks above. Yeah, very rectangular yes, square. So, that's, yeah. so that's, I mean, that's one of the things that makes the order of building quite clear. If we go into the aisle, there's a very nice tomb recess holding an effigy from that period. Oh, let's have a look. So an effigy, Peter. Yes, well, medieval almost certainly goes with the aisle. They go with this very nice recess he's lying in. Mm -hmm. A civilian. He's probably been holding something, but he's lost his hands and whatever he's holding. His head resting on a pillow flanked by I think, the remains of angels, although they really are battered. They are indeed. Yeah. A better condition, he's got a nice dog at his feet. Oh, Medieval right. hot water bottle, <laughs> or maybe heraldic significance. Yeah. And he's carved, I believe, in cellist and alabaster, which is a local oh, uh, very, ornamental very stone. Indeed, yeah. Very nice stone, although it does weather quite badly. Very soft. So he's suffered a bit over the ages. And then alongside the recess is this smaller recess with a trap of OG arch, fairly battered, but very interesting. It's got drawings. Mm. There is a drawing here of a, uh, looks to be a knight with a a shield with the cross of St George and holding a spear. Then there's later doodlers, which may be choir boys over the ages. But this one looks older. There's, you know, the plaster's cut away through it and things. Whether it's medieval or maybe Tudor or 17th century, I'm not sure. But it has the air of age to it. And that's unusual to find a drawing like this in a church. Yes. So the North Art Peter, very different to in South Art. Yes. Well, it's similar in that you can see a clear break between the masonry of the earlier wall, which here is quite rough rubble, mm. and the squared stone of the 15th century clerestory above. Yeah. But the arcade below is earlier, in style this is 13th century, maybe 100 years before the South Arcade. There's also two arches and then one. Yes. The, the actual pillars themselves with these nice attached shafts, a lot of the stonework is very fresh, and that's 1908. Right, it's recent. Though. Yes, it's recent, but it seems like they simply replicated exactly what was there beforehand. So it's correct restoration. Yes, so it's not going to damage it. Yes, so it, it looks that uh, um, people have thought that the whole nave was extended west, so they had a two bay aisle, then they extended everything. But the stonework, the rubble above, is very, very similar. It's consistent, isn't it? Yeah. Um, there's also, in the wall beyond, uh, we'll have a look, there's a, a blocked doorway. We have a walk across here. Right, Peter, it's got quite a lot of work on it on here. It's obviously been, well, you tell me what it has been. Well, not the doorway. <laughs> This, oh, this, this is the doorway. You can see the jam here. This is the original plaster still on the jam. Yes. So there's been a doorway here. Then it's always been later replaced by this window. Mm -hmm. But if we come around here, here's the present north door. So the door was blocked there and moved to here. And this door replaced an earlier window. You can see one side, the western jam, of this earlier window here. Mm -hmm. Now, put that together with this development of the arcade, where you have two arches and then one, yet no evidence that either the nave or the aisle were physically extended. Something's going on. Yeah. Now, I've got an idea, maybe you're wrong, but there was made possibly this bay of the aisle was walled off. It wasn't part of the main body of the church. In other places I've seen a priest's room or a priest's house within the church, and there could have been a priest's chamber in this end of the arcade. Then, soon after they built it, they did away with it, he lived somewhere else. They threw this into the main body of the church. They made an arch here. They made the doorway here, opposite the south door, as would usually happen. Yeah. And they blocked up that doorway and put a window there. We've got a, an obvious tunnel there yeah. from the north aisle through to the chancel. Very strange. Yeah, yeah. it seems strange. Right? You tell us what it is. Well, presumably it's the priest, who might have had his residence in the north aisle, as we've heard, mm -hmm. have access to the chancel. But it's very strange. I know of no other church where they have taken such a liberty I mean, both of the east angles of the nave have been quarried away by tunnels being cut through. This one is obviously for access to walk through, and it's quite sophisticated. We've seen this little window here yes. on the outside. This slab is another medieval grave slab recycled. Another one. Yeah. yeah, another one. You just see the shaft of a cross on it. But it's really quite, and it's been quite a big passage. In fact, it's got this block of masonry built into it. They cut it out even wider. They realised the church wasn't going to stay up. Right. And pretty soon they built that. Here, masonry into it. To hold it back. Yeah. Well, keep it together. Yeah. If we go across this side, we see what happened at the southeastern angle of the nave. And here, it's not a floor level tunnel, 
It's more of a squint, a see-through. There is an opening here that goes right through into the south aisle, the 14th century south aisle. Yeah. That would allow people in there a view through to the original position of the halber over here. Because remember the chancel, we only have half a chancel. The altar used to be further east. Right, yeah. But this squint aligns on the original altar. But this side of it, where they've chopped through a lot more masonry to get you through from the nave, that I don't understand. Because that would only allow you a view along the side of the chancel. I'm sure you anything. Yeah. So we've got some clear evidence of alterations here, Peter. What's been yeah. going on here? Well, we're at the east end of the nave. And this is where there was the rood loft, which would be a loft uh, well above the floor carrying a crucifix. You found them in all medieval churches. They were removed, removed at the Reformation, a lot of the rulings to remove these things. But here, there's a the blocked doorway. We'll see that a lot more clearly on the other side of the wall. But on the north side here, you can see all sorts of disturbance. There's been beams going in, yeah. there's sockets, all the patching. There's clearly things have gone on. But if we go into the east end of the south aisle, we'll see this doorway more clearly. Well, I can see what you mean, Peter. It's very clear from this side. Yes, it? yes. We're in, we're in the east end of a south aisle now, and there is the doorway that gave access to the rood loft that had been a ladder up to it. So it's very clear on this face of the wall. But as it was elsewhere in this church, an awful lot's happened because below it, you've got this, this big opening. Now, this is the squint through by which you get a view of the high altar in the original chancel. Mm -hmm. But this is clearly secondary because that cuts through this. Yes. There's been a tomb recess. You know, the aisle, remember, was the burial place of the memorial family, the Chantry Chapel. Yes. There's probably another effigy or a tombstone in here. Mm. But that's been chopped through when they put the squint through. So a lot's gone on. So something below it? Yes, there's, there's probably been a, there's been a tomb in there oh, no. at one stage. Yeah. So this vertical slit, what's this? And at the squint, I think. Squint? Yeah, we're on the, this is the north channel of a chancel arch, and there's a rather wider opening on the nave side. But you're right on floor level. Mm. What are you looking at? It's all yeah. very mysterious. I mean, maybe there's a sunken chamber of some sort. Right, yeah. Beside it, there are, there are knife sharpening grooves. See these big grooves? Yes. Something you often find on the jam of a doorway inside a medieval porch. But again, very down near, near the floor. Near the floor and... So it's also if the floor level might have been lower here. Yeah. If we ever got the chance to investigate the floors, it could be interesting. Oh, very. But there's other, other stuff we need to see in the chancel as well. If we go across this side... So this is the doorway? Yes, this is the priest's door. This is the one we saw on the outside, how the round arch late Norman. You can just see the... Yeah, yeah. If you look at these walls again, there's quite a few men who use many of the grave slabs. Yeah. Yeah. But if we go a bit further west here, on the window sill, on the sill of this nice 14th century three light window, is this stone. And this is a genuine link with the Knights Hospitalers. Mm -hmm. This is from the Hospitalers Preceptory from their monastery at Stid. Also, right. Yevely, yes. further up in the camp. Yes. And it's got a very nice octagonal bowl. A piscina is where the priest would wash the vessels at the end of Mass. So there's always a piscina in the wall near the altar. Yeah. And this, this was actually given as a gift, so it's not a it's more modern link. But it, it's from a genuine hospital site, because there's nothing in the fabric of the church here. It was owned by the hospitalers, but the fabric is after the, I say conventional, no church is really conventional, yeah. of the parish church. But, so this is a very, very fine piscina. And it was given to show the importance yes. of some of the... To show the link. Yes. To perpetuate the link. Yeah. yeah. Look. The villagers and priesters of St. Wilfrid's and Baron Trent, I'd like to thank you very thank much. Cheers. In most, in yes, thank you very, very interesting. Okay, cheers. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.